Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let's get started. Not too many more lectures left. So reminders, homework nine on regression to be submitted on Thursday before five o'clock. Finish that up. If you haven't already looked, another supplement, the bright yellow supplement number eight, has a lot of regression detail. Reminds you how to go through the output in SPSS to pull off things you need. Reminds you of those graphs that you can look at for checking conditions and what those conditions are. So supplement number eight is a really good summary of regression. And of course, your regression homework has two full problems with output from SPSS that you need to work with. So that may be of some use. There's a survey out there on the online homework tool. And if you complete it before Friday at noon, you will earn five points to be added onto your homework total. So that way you can earn back those couple points here and there that you maybe got off in a homework somewhere. Five points by Friday. Friday so that we can then convert that spreadsheet over, get it into your grade book, and have that information there for you next week. Uh, homework 10 is going to open up tomorrow. It's on the material we're covering this week. There's only four questions. I will be glad to go through those ideas of those four questions with you on Thursday. So I'm asking you to bring that copy of the questions, if you'd like, to follow along better with you on Thursday. So Thursday, we'll finish up our material. And then the last about 10, 15 minutes, we'll just look at that homework 10 together. That homework has to be turned in, though, by next Tuesday so that we can get it graded and into the grade book and have everything done for you in time. And it's also quite short. But having you do that last homework gives you another chance to earn close to 30 points on a homework. It's very short. Also, by forcing you to do that last material, you do better on the final. Whenever I've had that last homework be optional, not required, just recommended, not all students do it the same, and then that's the couple of questions on the final that tend to have lower scores. So homework 10 on the chi-score material that we start today and finish on Thursday. Bring a copy with you to class on Thursday. Your final exam, the 21st of April. This is that exam info page that's also up on C-Tools for you. You might be in a different location than you were before. We've got a few different rooms. We will not be having a review outside of class. Our review will be in class together next Tuesday. No new material on Tuesday, just review. Those questions will go up probably tomorrow for you, definitely before the weekend. And of course, your final is cumulative. But I have encouraged you to look at those old finals. You can even look at the point totals for the regression problem or the ANOVA problem and see how many points on a final in the past has been on that newer material, which I would make sure I understand really well first. Kind of then work backwards, exam two and then exam one. But those old three final exams, every question on there you could try out. There's nothing that you have to worry about skipping or not doing. All right, those are my main announcements. Do you have a question at all or comment before we turn to my favorite tests, chi-score tests? Questions or comments at all? All right, we're about page 205, is it? 205. This is chapter 15. For the last few weeks of class, we have been doing hypothesis testing and inference with quantitative data. We've been looking at means. Right before the exam, we finished the two sample t-test for two means. And then we did the ANOVA, analysis of variance. Again, for comparing the means of two or more populations. Regression required what kind of variables for your x and your y? They both had to be quantitative. Now we're finishing up the course by looking at three more tests. They're all called chi-square tests. 
that allow us to go back to the discrete or categorical data, being your response, but handling more than just a yes and no. We have had yeses and nos as our first type of test, the proportion problems, where you recorded and counted up how many were yeses and how many were nos. But now we're going to be able to do assessing of a model fits, checking for homogeneity, checking for true independence for categorical data through these chi-square tests. These are the three. We'll handle two of them today and one more on Thursday. The first one's called the goodness of fit test. We're going to have a discrete model for our discrete or categorical variable. Do you remember the number of toys played with is one of our models when we talked about discrete data? Number of toys played with in that psychology experiment, one, two, three, up to five. Well, we'll be able to test whether a particular model fits well with some data that we've gotten from a study or experiment. And that model can be for a discrete or categorical outcome with probabilities, which have to add up to one. We'll have a model that we're proposing, we'll have some data on that variable, and we'll see whether our observed counts that we have fit well with that model. One population, take one random sample, but now our response is either categorical or discrete, where we can't assume a bell curve, and we're seeing whether a particular model fits well based on our data. These two tests, the test of homogeneity and independence, are actually done exactly the same. The steps for calculating the statistic and doing everything exactly the same. They are both going to be data where you have a two-way table, rows and columns of counts. So it's really easy to recognize the chi-squared test when we look at them on the exam. The test of homogeneity is actually kind of like ANOVA, but now your response that you're seeing, whether it's the same, is categorical or discrete. So I want to know the response for opinion on some issue is the same for my two or more populations, rather than just the average response being the same when it was a quantitative variable before. And then the test of independence. Do you remember our definition of independence back in exam one? What was one of the definitions? The probability of A given B is supposed to be equal to what if they really are independent <coughs> events? Just the probability of A. And we had to use that definition to check for independence back in exam one. We said if those probabilities are equal, well, then you can say those events are independent. Well, what if the data you have where you're checking these kind of proportions is really a study, and it's, thus you have a sample only, not the entire population? What if the probabilities that you compute, the rates on your sample, look pretty close but not exact? Allowing for little natural variability, maybe they're close enough to say there's independence going on. And so we'll be able to assess that more with a formal test. A test to see whether two different variables, two discrete or categorical variables, are independent or whether there's some association. And analogous to this was our regression that we just finished, where we looked at whether there's an association or relationship between two quantitative variables, and now we get to do it for categorical data instead. So those are the three different tests by name. All three of them are going to be involving one new test statistic called an x squared test statistic. And if the H naught is true, if that model does fit, if they really are homogeneous, if they really are independent, then we're going to have a new distribution to work with for our test statistic. All of our test statistic values will end up following what is called a chi squared distribution with a certain degrees of freedom. And there's a couple pictures on the next page of a couple chi-squared models. So the chi-squared distributions kind of look like our more recent distributions that we've learned about, the F distributions. They're also skewed to the right. A chi-squared test statistic will be computed and can never be negative. All right. We have a couple different pictures here. And there's a really neat fact about chi-squared distributions that we actually will put to use in sort of a frame of reference form. If you looked at your chi-square distribution there with five degrees of freedom, five will turn out to be the balancing point for that distribution. The mean of a chi-square distribution turns out to be equal to its degrees of freedom. 
pretty interesting fact. What you expect for the value of your test statistic then will be the degrees of freedom for that distribution. So if we're doing a chi-square distribution and it's got two degrees of freedom, then I'm going to expect two as the value of my test statistic if H naught's true. And I'll be able to decide then if I'm not to whether I might reject H naught or not. The variance is also related to the degrees of freedom. If you take the degrees of freedom and double them, you get the variance. Now I usually want the standard deviation. So I can take my mean and go out and say a standard deviation each way to have sort of where I expect to see values fall. And so the standard deviation will have to be taking the square root of the variance. So in many of the examples that we'll go through together, we'll also take a look at the frame of reference side. We'll say, let's look at the degrees of freedom. Let's look at that standard deviation. And did our decision that we just made make sense with this frame of reference? Sometimes the frame of reference is enough to have us know whether we reject or fail to reject our corresponding hypothesis. The table that we're going to work with is a new table, table A5, which gives us areas to the right of various chi-squared statistic values. That turns out to be what we need for a p-value. Your p-value, just like in an f distribution, was always to the right. Chi-squared also, always to the right. No two-sided type of thing that we have to worry about. The table set up a little differently than our t-table. You've got your degrees of freedom. That'll tell us which row to look at and work with. And instead of having the test statistic values along the top, they're in the middle of the table. So you work along the table here and say, oh, our test statistic fall between these two numbers. And then you'll look up and find the bounds for your p-value. So it summarizes percentiles for us, starting with the 50th percentile, 50% to the right, 50% to the left. There's the upper 25th percentile. So that means there's 25% in the tail and 75% to the left. So that's the 75th percentile. And a few other smaller tail areas here. And then there is that function that we kind of worked with in lab a couple times, which can also find the exact p-value in picture for you too. So let's work with our table and answer a couple of questions that we have there. We're going to work with a chi-square distribution with four degrees of freedom. That's the row we're going to focus on. And so what's the answer to my first question there? If we're doing a chi-square distribution with four degrees of freedom. What's the mean? We just learned that interesting fact. The mean will be whatever the degrees of freedom are. So the mean or the balancing point of a chi-square distribution with four degrees of freedom will be four. So let's say that's about here. That's your balancing point. That's your mean. How about the median? Can you look up in your table and actually tell me what's the value on the axes that would cut your area in half, 50% above and 50% below? It's that first column entry with four degrees of freedom. What is it, 3.36? Really? Is the median being less than the mean make sense to you? That the mean's a little larger, got pulled out to the tail because of the skewness to the right? All right. Here's a couple of questions to have us find the areas to the right of numbers. Practicing the p-value idea. So how likely would it be to get a value of 4 or larger? So that happens to be our mean. That's not going to be 50%, right? Because the median is the 50% value. I want to know how likely is it to get 4 or larger? That's my first question here. So we use our table. And 4 is not in our chart exactly. Under the degrees of freedom of 4, the value is either 3.36 or the next one that's a little larger is 5.39. But those two values we do know about. We know what their areas to the right are. And so we can bound the area that we were interested in. The area to the right of the 3.36 we already established was the median, so that's 50%. The area to the right of the 5.39, according to our table, is it's the upper 25th percentile. So 5.39 is really what for notation? 
Remember how we would denote that number in the distribution? Q3? Q3, the 75th percentile? And so what can we say about how likely it is to see a value of 4 or larger? That probability would be between what two numbers? Between 0.25 and 0.50. It's quite likely to see 4 or something larger. It would happen between 25 and 50% of the time if this were the actual model that we have for our values. So it's quite likely to see 4 or larger. 4 also happens to be your mean, what you expect to see on average if this is the right model. So your mean or expected value is quite likely to occur, or something larger, um, under this model. So if we get a value of our statistic that is 4, our actual degrees of freedom, we're going to stay with H0. Because if this were our p-value, we're certainly going to stay with H0. It's a huge p-value. Now, a test statistic value you might get when you compute it might be a little bit larger. It's going to turn out that larger means rejecting. So what if we got a 10.3? Can you do the same idea that we just did and give me the bounds for what this probability would be, which would be a p-value in a problem later? So chi-squared still distribution with 4 degrees of freedom. I think this table is a little easier to actually work with. 10.3 is further out in the tail, and I would like to know what that area is. You can fall anywhere in the chart. Sometimes you fall in between two numbers, sometimes you fall off the edge. With four degrees of freedom, we are in the middle. The two closest numbers are 9.49, and the other one's a little bigger. What is that, 11, 14? And so those in the table are values I know then, what their upper tail percentages will be. The 9.49 happens to be which one? The upper fifth percentile. In other words, if alpha is 5% in doing a test with four degrees of freedom, Anything larger than 9.49 will probably give us a small p-value, small enough to reject. And that 11.14 is in the next column at 0 .02, 0 0.025. So now how likely is it to get that kind of value or something larger? Now it's not as likely. It would happen only between 25 and 5% of the time if this were actually the right model if h is true. So if that happens to be a range for what you think the p-value is going to be, somewhere between there, would you say you would be statistically significant at 5%? If this is your reported bounds for your p-value, would you be statistically significant at 5%? Yeah. yeah. Would you be significant at a 1% level? No. And what's nice about the table is that these cuts are common levels of alpha, so you will always be able to make your decision. You'll know how you sit relative to 0.05, because you'll fall in between, and 0.05 could be one bound. All right, so there's practice with the char chart a little bit, our table. We're going to be calculating these test statistic values, and the top of the next page, 207, kind of presents the idea behind this new test statistic. As I mentioned, the chi-squared tests are going to be pretty easy to identify on a homework or on an exam because you're going to get a table of counts. You're going to have your observed counts for your one variable that's categorical or for your two-way table of counts. And so that's what the data will consist of, observed counts, how many fell into each category. We'll work out the expected counts, ones that you expect to see in those categories if the H0 is true. Expect accounts under H0. And then we'll compare them. How close were the observed counts that we saw in our data to the expected ones under H0? Obviously, if they're close and they match up well, I should stay with H0. If they're quite different when I look at their distances and compare them, then I should reject H0. And our test statistic that we're going to compute, this x squared test statistic, is going to be a measure of how close they are. So if it's large, this test statistic value, that's telling you your observed data, your observed counts, and those expected ones under H0 are really different. So we will reject. The only direction of extreme is large, to the right. 
There's not two-sided versions here again, just like in the F test. So when the statistic gets to be too big, we will end up rejecting H0. We'll figure out whether it's big enough by reporting its p-value to see how far it is in that upper tail. All right, so we have a couple of chi-square tests to get through today. We're going to just go through them together with actual data starting right at the beginning rather than derive them more theoretically at the beginning. And the first one is the test of goodness of fit. The background for goodness of fit. You know how you ask yourself the questions to figure out what tests might you do here. How many populations do you have? Just one. And you have one random sample from that population. And then the variable that you're measuring, your response, is no longer something that can be assumed to be normally distributed. It's maybe categorical, so it's not even going to have a density at all, or very discrete, so it would have a probability model that we would put in a table with various probabilities for those finite and small number of outcomes that are possible. And what we'll have is a proposed model for that discrete or categorical variable, and we want to know whether that model seems to fit well based on our data. So here's the background for the one we'll do. The population is going to be all the cars exiting a toll road and recording which of the four toll booths they go through to pay that toll. Are those four booths used equally often is the model we'd like to assess. Our data will consist of a random sample of 100 cars that exited, and we'll use that data to assess whether the model of equally likely use of those four booths seems to fit well. And here's that data. A one-way table of counts, the observed counts from our 100 cars. So the total here, of course, is 100 for the 100 cars. 26 of the cars were observed to go through booth 1, 21 through booth 2, 28 and 26. So in a goodness of fit problem, you'll have a one-way table of counts, not rows and columns, but just a set of observed counts on your one variable. The number of categories you have is K. That's the notation for the goodness of fit, 4 here. And we have to specify the model. The H0 will be that probability model or distribution that we want to see if it fits well. Now, it's not given directly, but it does say, are those four booths used equally often? So what will be the model for those four probabilities for the proportion of cars going through each of those booths? Each one of those probabilities should be what? If they're equally likely and there's four of them, one-fourth, 0.25. The probability model for each of these four outcomes then, equally likely, just take one over however many you had. One-fourth for each of those or 0.25 is fine. Now what's nice about the chi-square tests is that the HA is easy to write. It's not H0. It's some other model. The probabilities are not as specified in H0. In this case, that means there's at least two of them that are different. Maybe all four are different, but at least two of them are different. It's some other model. All right, so there's our H0. We have the data, the observed counts. We have our proposed model that we want to see if it fits well. We have to find those expected counts. We said that we're going to compare the observed counts to what you would have expected to see if H0 were really true, but that's easy. What are the expected counts? If H0 is true, the four booths are used equally often, how many cars would you have expected to go through booth 1? 25. And how many for booth 2? All the way down. How did you get the 25? 100 cars, 25% each, n times p. n times p was a formula you've had for a mean in the past. The expected counts, the formula generically for them, is take the sample size times that corresponding probability that your model in H0 said should be that probability. So here they turned out to be nice whole numbers. 100 cars, 25 percent, 25 cars. What if I had recorded the data for 101 cars? What would have been the expected count for each of those then? 
not 25 anymore, but 25.25, and that would have been your expected count. You're not going to round those expected counts because these are really the expected values, expected counts are what you expect on average or means. So we learned that we don't have to round a mean to a whole number just because it's a discrete variable and can't take on values that are fractions. It's not 25.25 cars for this one sample, but across many samples of 101. So whatever you get for that expected count, keep it, no rounding to whole numbers. All right, so we've got the observed counts. We've got the expected counts. Usually you put those expected counts into the parentheses in a table right next to the observed. That's how SPSS will report them if you click on the option to give the expected counts with the output too. And now we need to find a measure of how close they are. 26 and 25 look pretty close. 20 and 25 are a little further away. So let's develop our test statistic. I hope it makes sense that we'll start with the observed counts and say how close are they to the expected ones that I want some measure of that distance. Now those distances though, sometimes they're positive, sometimes they're negative. So what do we typically do to avoid the canceling? We squared things. So we'll look at the squared distance, good. But right now, in that first class, it's 26 minus 25. That's only a distance of one. One squared is just one. It doesn't look very big. What if I had more data? What if I had 1,000 cars? And therefore, I would have expected 250. And what if I got 260? So it's the same problem, but just more data. Now the distance of those two would be 260 and 250, difference of 10. 10 squared now looks like 100. Looks much bigger, but it's actually the same kind of problem. I need to standardize this by some idea of how big these counts are. So I have it relative to the size of what was in each of those classes. So that standardizing idea means put something on the bottom. We'll standardize by what was expected to have a relative frame of reference there. So that's the quantity. That's the measure of how close our observed data is to the expected. We'll do that over all of the cells. That's your test statistic. Same test statistic for all three tests that we do this week. So you find it the same way. You'll get the expected counts a little different for the other two tests, but once you find them, it's the same form. Can you see that's never going to be negative? Right? So let's calculate it. We have four terms to work out. Twenty-six observed, twenty-five expected, over twenty-five. There's the contribution. Here's the contribution to our x squared statistic from the first cell or the first category. We'll have one of those contributions from each of our different cells. What's the next one look like? Twenty minus twenty-five squared. There'll be four terms for the four classes. And when they're equally likely, it's kind of nice because you have the same denominator then. 25 on the bottom. On the top, I'll have a 1 squared, which is 1. 5 squared, which is 25. 3 squared is 9. And another 1 at the end. We get a 36 on top and a 25 on the bottom. Test statistic value 1.44. What's the smallest my test statistic could ever be? Zero. If the observed counts equaled the expected counts exactly every time, then you'd have no distance at all. Now that shouldn't happen too often either because that's looking too good. You expect some variability even in sampling from the expecteds and your observes. All right, but is this big enough? 1.44 is a measure of how close or compatible our data is. And we're looking for a large value to tell us to reject H naught. 
is 1.44 going to be large enough? Well, to have you find its p-value, to assess if it's extreme or not, you need to know the chi-squared distribution. I need to know the degrees of freedom. So you just gave me a probability model in H0. You gave me those four probabilities. If I gave you three of them, could you figure out the fourth one always? If it's a probability model? So if there are four of them, four probabilities, there's really only three that are free to vary and be you know, various probabilities that they could be, and then the last one's fixed to add up to one. So your degrees of freedom are k minus one. Always the number of probabilities or cells minus one. So we need to use our distribution now, our H0 model, to find the p-value. Let's do that at the top of the next page. You've got three degrees of freedom and a test statistic of 1.44. I need you to sketch a chi-squared density with three degrees of freedom. Put on your axes that 1.44 that you got. And the p-value is always the chance of getting what you got or more extreme under that H0 model. More extreme is always to the right for a chi-squared test. So it's finding an area just like we practiced with our table back a couple pages so we can work out that p-value. So there is a generic chi-square distribution. My x-axis now has a label. It's the x-squared test statistic value. This is a model for what kind of values you'd get for your test statistic, x squared. And 1.44, I even kind of know where that's going to be on the curve here, don't I? Because what's the balancing point for this one? What's the mean or the balancing point of this distribution? Three, and I'm even less than that. So I am over here on the left side a bit. Let's say right there, oops, 1.44. And my p-value would be the probability of getting that observed test statistic value or something even larger, more extreme, under this H0 model. Visually, the way I've drawn it, I can see it's pretty big. The closest value you've got in your chart is what value? If you're looking at three degrees of freedom, back on page 206 or something like that, 206. The smallest value even in that row is what? 2.37. 2.37 is your median. There's 50% to the right of that. How big is your p-value? It's bigger than 50%. If you want to bound on the other side, it's less than 1, because it is a probability between 0 and 1. It's a very large p-value. I can't pinpoint it exactly, but I know it's huge. Am I statistically significant at any reasonable level of alpha? No. If we're not statistically significant, if our p-value is big compared to alpha, then we're staying with H0. We cannot reject that null hypothesis. That null hypothesis of equally likely use of the four booths can't be refuted. Our data does not go against that. So our conclusion, at a 5% level, it appears that the four booths are used equally often for the population of cars that our sample represents. I mean, if they took these 100 cars all on a Friday morning, that might be a different model that happens then with the more active use, perhaps, than on you know, a Sunday afternoon or something. Who knows? So we have to know a little bit more about how the data was gathered. But we can't refute that equally likely model. So here's a chi-squared problem where maybe you don't want to reject H0. 
It's not always that HA is your researcher's theory that you want to show. It might be that you want to establish the model still holds. So we're hoping we fail to reject. All right, there's our first goodness of fit test and your summary. It's at the bottom. Let's take a look at that aside, that frame of reference. You told me a minute ago that you knew that the mean or the balancing point for this model, this H0 model, was 3, because that's the degrees of freedom. So our value of 1.44 was definitely way over there on the left side. <coughs> Chi-square distributions have the property that their mean is equal to the degrees of freedom. That's standard deviation you can also find based on the degrees of freedom. So if H0 is true in our problem here, what was the expected value for our test statistic? The expected value or mean is 3. When you were doing t-tests before or a z-test before, what was the mean or the expected value then for your test statistic? You drew your t-curve or your z model, normal 0, 1. 0 was your mean. For chi-square distributions, it's not 0. That's not what you expect. You actually expect some variability, and 3, the degrees of freedom here, is what we'd expect. How about the give or take? Square root of twice 3. Square root of 6 brings you back to about 2.45. 2.45. So 3 is what you'd expect to see if h is true. I'm going to reject h naught and go with the alternative, say the model doesn't fit, if I get a value that's really large. If your x squared statistic, which is how close is your data to h naught, is big, it's saying your data is not close to h naught. I reject if I'm big. Here's 3, what I expect. And where did I fall? Way down here, even below 3. Whenever your test statistic falls below that degrees of freedom, you know you're not going to reject h naught. Because you only reject if you get a really large value. And if you're even smaller than what you expected to see under H0, there's no way you're big enough to reject. So the degrees of freedom does help you decide if you might have evidence or not. And whenever you observe a value like 1.44, which is even less than what you expected to see under H0, you're not even in that tail where you were hoping to be to reject. Now, that 3 is not your critical value. Just because I got 3.1 or 3.2 isn't automatically going to say reject H0 now. You've got to see if you're far enough in the tail. But if you're below, there's no way you'll be large enough to reject. Good frame of reference to use. We'll try it again in many of our examples. And then you've got a little summary. Part of this information is on your yellow card. The yellow card does give you your test statistic formula, your yellow card reminds you of your degrees of freedom, and it gives you, I believe, the, let's make sure, the name of the test is provided, and those expected counts, yep. So you will be needing to specify in some way that H0 for me. I'll give it to you in the problem in some sense. Here it was equally likely, so you had to work out the 1 fourth or 0.25. Not every H0 will be equally likely. There can be other models you want to test, which we'll see in just a moment. And then there's a little bit of note down here. Do you remember when you were doing binomial versus a large sample Z? You had to check to see if your sample size was large enough before, right? With that n times p idea being at least 10, the at least 10 rule. Well, that's similar here. We don't require that every single category has at least 10. We just have to make sure that none of them have a zero. Because if you had a zero count in any of your classes, then you have no information about that class. So none of them can be a zero. And it states here that to have the chi-squared model hold adequately, at least 80% of the counts have to be greater than 5. Now, that's a lot of work to check out, but if you worked out your expected counts, you can see right away all of them were 25. They're all bigger than 5. And what's nice about SPSS, it puts a little note on the bottom telling you what the smallest expected count was and making sure that that condition is met. And it gives you a warning if it's not. All right, let's look at P's. 
I used to hate peas growing up. I was fed those ones that are from the cans that are really mushy, not so good. I used to swallow them with milk when I had to eat them. And my father to this day tells me that I used to line them up under my plate to hide them, making them pretend like I ate them. I don't remember that, but he tells me. And so every time we all get together, we always have peas on the menu. All right. This is a genetics example. Crossbreeding of peas. Yellow round peas with green wrinkled ones. The results of an experiment with 556 such crossbreedings. We would like to assess whether the results here are consistent with what genetics would say should be the outcome. That these four types occur with these four probabilities. That's based on dominant versus recessive and a model underlying it. So there's the breakdown of what we observed. Can you write out H0? If the categories are not with numbers, it makes sense, I hope, to just call that first one category number one, next one category two, and so on. So that way I can use my P1 notation without having to write as a superscript or subscript that is like round and yellow and so on. So what does the model say? The probability of falling in that first class should be 9 sixteenths. The probability of falling in the second class, 3 sixteenths. That's the same for the third one. And you could always figure out the last one by subtraction because this has to be a legitimate probability model here. The probabilities you specify for me in your H0 need to add up to 1. If it's not an equally likely model, well, then I have to somehow give you that model so you can write it down. And I would do that. We're supposed to do the test at a 1% level of significance. Our HA is that the probabilities are not as given in H0. There's something else. There's our observed data. What do we need next? To get your test statistic, you need not just the observed counts, but also the expected counts. There's a couple of expectations here. There's the expected counts, four of them, that you need to work out. And then there's that thing called the expected value of your test statistic. That's our degrees of freedom. So we need the expected counts. Can we work out that? How would I find that first expected count? The rule is easy. It's on your yellow card. It says n times p. 556 is your n. p is 9 sixteenths. So that first cell expected count is 312.75. And I'll have to do it again for this next one. 556 times just 3 sixteenths, cut it in a third. So that's going to be 104.25. I can get the last one by subtraction because they have to all add up to the 556 again. Or do it by multiplying by 1 16th. And I get the last cell being 34.75. So there's our expected counts under H0. Notice I'm not rounding them. I'm keeping them to some level of accuracy here. All right, so the test statistic has to be found. This one will not be as easy to do in your head. There will be four terms. What does the first one look like? Observed, 315. But we expected for that count, 312.75. Divide by 312.75. There will be four terms in all. I'm just going to write out the first and the last one for you. If you were doing this for an exam, I would expect four terms, plug them in, and then give me your answer at the end is fine. But seeing the numbers you used, or at least those expected counts, helps me to know where there might be a mistake if you made one to give you partial credit. 32 observed, 34.75 expected. So this would require a little bit more calculator work. 
each one of these four terms is telling you the contribution to that statistic that you're finding from that particular class. Sometimes you go back to those four terms to say, if you get a large x squared, where were the differences really big? What was the biggest contribution to my statistic to tell me where there was more difference in my data compared to the model? That's where it wasn't matching up. All right, this particular test statistic, though, is actually very small. Point four seven. And your one and only clicker question is for you to find the p-value and pick from my choices on the next slide. Should be pretty familiar to you, the process and what you get. So find for me the p-value using your table A5. That's back a few pages again you can use. Check it out with your neighbor if you want. We have a very small test statistic value. How many degrees of freedom here? Three again. Four outcomes, three degrees of freedom. So then we just do one kind of like this not too long ago. The value you get for your test statistic can be a small number, can be a large number. That value you get for your test statistic, though, isn't always between 0 and 1, and therefore it's not necessarily going to be your p-value. That's your test statistic value. The alpha you're doing the test at is 0.01, but your p-value turns out to be what? <coughs> Big. Bigger than half is the best you can say. Correct. More than 0.5. In fact, it's really much more than 0.5. Remember the range we said we would expect here? Three, give or take about two and a half was that standard deviation. If you go out a standard deviation from your three, our test statistic value is even outside of that range. It's really, really close to zero. In fact, it looks a little bit too good. We're supporting that theory, that h naught model, is not refuted at all. In fact, the data matches up with that h naught model a little too closely. Now, I've seen that happen with students. One of the exam or homework questions I used to assign for the last homework was to make you take a die and, as an experiment, roll it 60 times and do a chi-squared test of goodness of fit to see if it's a fair die. All right. So you're supposed to roll it 60 times, record your observed counts of 1 through 6, and do the chi-square test on that. So what would you expect for the number of 1s to get if you did it 60 times? You'd expect 10, 1 sixth, 10 1s, 10 2s, 10 3s, and so on. So a number of students didn't want to actually sit and roll a fair die, go find a die and roll it 60 times. So they still did it by putting in some numbers, some observed counts. 9, 11, maybe a 10 for that third one. And the counts that get put in when you are trying to pretend to be a little varying, you don't tend to vary things enough. And so you often see test statistic values that aren't what you expect to see. I would expect a chi-square distribution with 5 degrees of freedom. So the average of the chi-square test statistics that you all give me should end up averaging to about 5 with a give or take. And the average usually tends to be much less than five. 
because when you put in data that you think is varying a little bit enough, it tends to not vary much. It looks too good, too close to the truth. What about these results? Are they too good? It was Mendel, I believe, had his made-up assistant. Here's my assistant, so-and-so, who's supposedly going to help me keep me unbiased. Didn't exist. So was the data made up too? Was the data hand-picked? Maybe the assumptions didn't hold. Because it's supposed to be a random sample, but if you end up kind of hand-picking which subjects you're going to include, which items you're going to count, that can make it look too good. Or, as is possible, what you're measuring with your p-value is you're measuring how likely it is to see those results, so more extreme under H0. There's always a chance, a small chance or a large chance, depending on what kind of p-value. But do we just see an unusually too good result in this case? All right. The one that's on the bottom of that page, posted already on C-Tools for you, the actual test statistic value that's reported there is off. So the correct one is on the posted version. So it's a good one for you to try. And we'll be skipping one other chi-squared problem in these notes that's already up there for you too, under lecture information. So you can try that out. My pictures of the day are next. They are just of my kids, because I love my kids. And they grow up too fast. You are now the age of my kids. Oh, it's getting old. That's OK. It's fine. Family. And we've got one more test to go through together. It's about ice cream. What's your favorite flavor of ice cream? We'll do that as our homogeneity test example. So page 211. One of your homework 10 questions, actually all four of them that we'll do the beginning of together on Thursday, there's three chi-square tests. Output from SPSS will say chi-square test. But you'll have to identify, is it goodness of fit? Is it homogeneity? Or is it the third one, independence? Homogeneity and independence look alike. The data set up's the same, but the background is different. In a test of homogeneity, you will always be talking about comparing two or more populations, not just one population, like in the independence test. Two or more populations, so you're taking two or more independent random samples, one from each, and you're measuring one thing. You're measuring one response that happens to now be categorical or discrete. And you want to know if the distribution for your response is the same, homogeneous, the same for your populations. Chi-square test of homogeneity is comparing populations with respect to your one variable you're measuring to see if the model for that variable is the same or not. So here's our ice cream problem. We have two populations that we're studying, boys versus girls in preschool, asking them, you know, what's your ice cream preference out of the classic chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry options? Is the ice cream preference the same for boys versus girls is the question. We have two random samples of 75 from each of our two populations with independent samples being taken. Here's our two-way table of counts. Two-way table of counts is how your data will be set up for a chi-square test of homogeneity or independence. But the clue here is the background of the problem, that I have two random samples, that even before I go and ask them their preference, before I even put in the counts here, I know these two totals. I know that the total boys, if they all answer, should be 75. And the total for the girls should be 75. And the reason why I know these totals in advance is because I took samples of those sizes. So in a two-way table where the row or column totals, one of them is known in advance because they're your sample sizes, because you took samples from populations, means it's a homogeneity test. All right, so here's our observed counts. We need to write out our statement of H0. H0 is for a test of homogeneity. H0 will say things are homogeneous. You have written in your notes the way we can say it correctly in words, which is often the preference here 
rather than using that little more mathematical notation that is also explained. The more mathematical notation has probabilities and things in there, and you have to specify them for all outcomes and all populations. Or we can just say it in words, which is easier. The distribution for, put in your response, ice cream preference, is the same for your populations here of boys versus girls. So you will be putting in for your problems, of course, the response here. I want it to be in the context of the problem, so if it's ice cream preference, put in that ice cream preference variable there. The key will always be that you're seeing if things are the same, if the distribution is the same, because that's the homogeneity test. And then it better be stated for your populations, not for the samples, but for the populations. HA, not H naught. It's something else, that they are not the same. They differ in some way, and they are not the same. Okay, so there's our H naught. We've got our observed counts. We need to find those expected counts. Not too hard to do. Let's think it through. How many kids preferred, oh, let's go back, sorry. Get, give me your totals for the vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry all the way across. How many liked vanilla all together? 51. How many like chocolate all together? 53. How many like strawberry all together? 46, which of course does add up to the 150 again. I need those totals to work out the expected counts. So let's start with the strawberry preference group. How many kids said strawberry overall? 46. If H naught's true, if the distributions for preference is really the same, then how many of those 46 would you have expected to be boys versus girls? 46 altogether like strawberry, you can't change that count. Then how should it be broken up or distributed to their boys versus girls if really the model's the same? 23 each? Does that make sense? My two samples were of balance, the same size. If 46 altogether like strawberry, then half should be boys and half should be girls. All right, there's our two expected counts for the strawberry group. Let's do the same for chocolate. How many said chocolate altogether? That was the largest count, 53. How many then would we have expected to be boys versus girls now? 26 and a half. And that's okay for an expected count. Remember, expected counts don't have to be whole numbers. Now, obviously, if you didn't have 50-50 for the percentage breakdown, half boys and half girls, you'd have to change those counts. You'd have to do the reweighting. If there were twice as many boys and girls, you'd have to do twice as many expected compared to the other. We'll show you how to do that in a moment. 51 is the last one for the vanilla group. Half of that would be 25 and a half. All right, so go ahead and put those expected counts in those parentheses in your table, which has your row and column totals. Your expected counts should also preserve those row and column totals. And then what we're going to do is show you the quick and easy formula for finding those expected counts without having to reason it through. Because if I didn't have 75 boys and 75 girls, if I had, say, 82 and 71, it would be a lot harder to think that through. You have to get the right rate. So let's see what we do. When we did it for the vanilla group and got 25 and a half, we took the 51 kids that liked vanilla. And we said for boys, well, boys is 75 out of the 150 kids altogether. Half were boys. Half of the 51. So all I'm going to do is put that back into more of a formula here where I've got the totals for the row and columns being multiplied on top and the overall totals on the bottom. And what you call this then is your cross product rule. You take the one total, you divide it or multiply by the other total, when that's taken as a fraction of the overall, you're getting the right weight, 
And so the cross product rule is the formula for finding expected counts in general. And that one is on your yellow card, so you don't have to remember it. You don't have to think through every one like that. You can just do the cross product rule. All right, so our expected counts are there. Our observed counts are there. We need a test statistic, please. <coughs> I've written out the first term for you. We're going to cheat a little bit for time and write dot, dot, dot. Please write out the last term. How many terms will I have in this particular test statistic? Six altogether. Six terms to add up to get our test statistic. Our test statistic here would be turning out to be 1.73. The larger your test statistic, the more different your observed counts were from what you expected to see under H0. Now we've already got a little sense for some of these values. We've seen two statistics that have been pretty small. Is this statistic also quite small? Well, you need to kind of know what the degrees of freedom are to be able to assess that. Is 1.73 small enough? Well, here's our new degrees of freedom. What were they before when you just had a single row with four categories, you did four minus one, because those had to add up to 100%. Well, the idea is going to be similar here. If you know that half of them were boys, then you can figure out that the other half were girls, 50%. So if I know the two columns are here, I only really need to know one of them, and I can get the other by subtraction. So it's the number of columns minus one times the number of rows minus one, because whenever you know all but one of them, you can figure out the last. Rows minus one times columns minus one, or the other way around. Two-way table means I need all but one, and I can figure out that last probability by adding them up to one. Same thing for the rows as the columns. So there's your degrees of freedom for a two-way table. What do we have here? We have 1.73. Our table was a 2 by 3 table. So 2 minus 1 is 1, 3 minus 1 is 2, 2 degrees of freedom for our particular test here. Our one last time then for finding a p-value, please. 2 degrees of freedom, chi-squared model. One point seven three is what we observed. Now here's what an actual chi squared with two degrees of freedom looks like. It actually never comes back down to the zero. I'm not going to ever take off if you just draw the basic skewed to the right model to represent a chi squared. That's fine. One point seven three. I kind of have a feeling is over here because I know the balancing point here is two, and the p value is always the same. The probability of getting what you got for your test statistic or something even more extreme, in this case it's larger, assuming h naught's true. So let's not forget that this is our h naught model for our test statistic. That's why we drew this chi-square distribution. The table now needs to be used with two degrees of freedom, instead of our three or four before. Two degrees of freedom, the 1.39 falls on one side, and that happens to be the 50th percentile. And the other bound for my test statistic is 2.77, which happens to be the upper 25th percentile. So I again get one of those pretty large p-values. I can put it as bounds in words, or I can use a little notation and say, here's the range where your p-value is going to fall, somewhere between 25 and 
I'm still able to make my decision. At a 5% level of significance, do I reject H0 or fail to reject? That you've done many times. Now you can do it in your sleep, I hope. If your p-value is small, you reject H0. If your p-value is not small, you stay with H0. P-value is high. HO is your guy. What's our conclusion about ice cream preference for preschool boys and girl populations? H0 says, and remember this, H0 is your name of the test. It's a test of homogeneity. That's what H0 is talking about, test of homogeneity. They are the same. It appears that. We're not proving, we're not confirming this is true, but it appears that the distribution of ice cream preference is the same for what? Let's talk about the population, the populations of preschool boys and girls and we could always add represented by our samples. Our third chi-squared test we have done together today. We will do one more homogeneity and move into independence together on Thursday. What are you going to remember to bring? Copy of homework 10, please. If you'd like to follow along better, 